Fusion has enough fuel to carry the Earth for as long as it's spinning around the sun. Fusion energy has been considered one of the holy grails of energy generation. Fusion has the promise of being able to do very high intensity base power. We have to get the technology and the, and the science to the place where we're actually getting more energy out than we put in. Fusion power is 30 years away and always will be. Or so goes the joke in the field, where decades of research and massive government-funded efforts to replicate the power source of the sun have mostly met with missed deadlines, cost overruns, and incremental progress. But a growing number of venture-backed players say they can deliver streamlined commercial reactors within 10 years, promising a carbon-free energy source with effectively limitless fuel, potentially in time to ease some of the spiraling risks of climate change. A team at Lockheed Martin revealed late last year that they're at work on a truck-sized fusion reactor. Amazon's Jeff Bezos and others have plugged money into General Fusion in Burnaby, Canada. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, Ben Rock, and others have invested in Tri-Alpha Energy in Southern California. And Peter Thiel's Mithril and Y Combinator have funded a Redmond, Washington startup called Helion Energy. There is, however, considerable skepticism in the scientific community that these ventures can achieve such ambitious timelines or whether they can pull off fusion at all. Recode recently met with Helian CEO David Kirtley to learn more about their particular approach and why he's optimistic about a near-term timeline for commercializing fusion. Fundamentally, in fusion is the same process that happens in the sun. Fusion energy takes two lightweight atoms. And then at very, very high pressures, these two atoms are forced together to form a larger molecule. You need 100 million degrees temperatures like in the sun. And there's a number of approaches, the biggest of which is tokamax or eater. And this is focused on holding a hot plasma in one location long enough that you can get to fusion conditions. There's another way being done at Lawrence Livermore National Ignition Facility. At very, very high pressures using high power lasers, you can at high densities overcome those forces. Now what Helion does is a little different from the government program. We do something called magneto inertial fusion where we combine the bests of steady magnetic fusion and pulsed inertial fusion by using only high intensity electromagnetic fields to compress a fuel, a plasma, to high temperatures. And as fusion happens, it pushes back on that magnetic field, and then you can actually take that expansion process and use that to generate electricity. We're talking about power plants that aren't gigawatts in scale, but tens of megawatts in scale. What that means is now you're several orders of magnitude lower in cost and time scales. Three years from now, we can build our next prototype that puts out more energy than we put in. It would be difficult to overstate the promise of commercializing fusion. It's free from the meltdown dangers of fission, potentially far more efficient than renewables like solar and wind. And unlike fossil fuels, it wouldn't pump out the greenhouse gases that are warming the planet. Recode visited the National Ignition Facility in Livermore, California, to discuss the promise of fusion and the state of the science with Mark Herman, the lab's director. He said it's no exaggeration to call the technology a silver bullet, if it works. Absolutely, and the, and the, the challenge, of course, is from the technology and engineering and economics, we have to make it attractive enough for, that, for it to be that silver bullet. You want to have uh, sources of energy that are carbon-free, that are, that are safe, that we can uh, have all over the world without worrying about non-proliferation. The massive $3.5 billion facility within the sprawling Lawrence Livermore Lab aims 192 laser beams at a fuel-filled capsule about the size of a BB. But even with those resources, the lab has faced considerable challenges. Last year, NIF pulled off a first, generating more energy from a fusion reaction than the amount of energy deposited into the fuel during the process. But that's still a long way from the elusive goal of ignition, generating more energy than the total used in the process. Can't say exactly when we'll get there, um, but we, you know, the important thing for the scientists is, are we making progress in our understanding? And, and we're definitely making progress in our understanding, so that's, that's what keeps us motivated. Meanwhile, considerable government funds and scientific hopes have been pinned on ITER, a reactor under construction in southern France. But the so-called tokamak reactor, which spins the plasma fuel in the shape of a donut, is years behind schedule, and estimated costs have more than tripled to around $20 billion. So what chance does a tiny operation in a suburban office park really have? 
Very little if you ask Edward Morse, a professor focused on nuclear engineering at UC Berkeley, who has explored alternative approaches to fusion. I think the main point is these concepts are old, and they generally started in National Lab experiments as early as the 1950s, and they simply didn't have any traction. The performance of these machines of the type that they were making then and they're still making now, with small variations, was simply not up to scale. What you find is that some of the old players in those laboratory experiments have gone off and sought venture capital funding to continue these efforts. But it was for some cause, I might say, that the Department of Energy scaled back those efforts. It's probably a better investment than that Nigerian prince that keeps emailing me, but I would not invest my money in it. Of course, each of the private efforts are pursuing fusion along distinct paths. Tri-Alpha has developed a so-called colliding beam reactor that fires rings of plasma toward one another within a long tube. Meanwhile, General Fusion employs synchronized pistons that compress plasma spinning inside of a vortex. Plenty of researchers have raised questions in the scientific press about these efforts as well. But Herman and others argue it's encouraging to see new players exploring a variety of approaches, at least so long as the findings are shared. The proprietary um, uh, nature of, of some of the work will limit that exchange of ideas. So, you know, that, that, that would be just one concern, that we won't make quite as fast progress. But obviously I understand that for an investor to, uh, you know, want to put a, a lot of resources in something, they want to know that if they, if they make progress, then there's going to be a payoff at the end. Timelines matter here because the longer the world runs on fossil fuels, the more lasting damage that will be done. Most climate scientists think we're already past dangerous thresholds of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And once it's there, CO2 can take thousands of years to work out of the system. For his part, Helans Kirtley remains optimistic about the odds of their efforts and encouraged by the emergence of private players in the fusion space. We're very excited for it. We think that we're transitioning this technology away from billion dollar scale government programs to these small private fusion efforts where innovation can build on all of those years of R&D and science to then move forward with small distributed fusion systems.